there are very few people in this country who have led as active a life across business, charity, and politics, and has made such a positive mark in the process as our guest tonight. To describe all that he has done will take longer than his 89 years. But if ever a name fitted a man, it has to be the one that is attached to Lord David Young, CH, which stands for Member of the Order of Companions of Honor, also known as AKA Dude, D-U-D-E, a new title that has been given to him, self-appointed self this evening. David, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to Marie Oscar for suggesting this conversation and welcome to the members of your family who have joined us as well. And That's if we right. take a very quick look around, David, on, on Zoom, you will see that there are masses of your friends who have all piled in to participate tonight. It's really exciting. Okay, I'm going to start by asking you the hardest question you have ever been asked in public, and I hope that you're prepared for it. Your bow tie. Yes. Your trademark bow tie. Yes. I need to know whether you tie it yourself or whether you use one of those new fandangled kind oh, of things where it comes all prepared and you just have to clip it in. Shlomo, shame on you. No English gentleman <laughs> takes a, a clip on. I will tell you why I wear bow tie. 1990, I'd finished with politics and I did a lot of television in those days. And one day I said to myself, look, if I wear a bow tie, nobody will ask me to go on television. So I threw away my ties. I started wearing bow ties, but it didn't work. Later on, I got invited to go back on television. So like most of my plans, they don't always work out in the well, way in which I'd hoped. I'm totally sympathetic about plans that don't work out because I <laughs> once attended a black tie event wearing a bow tie. And someone turned around to me at the dinner and said, why are you not wearing a tie? And I then realized that beards and bow ties <laughs> are incompatible. Yeah. Plans that don't work out. Okay, I want to start at, uh, very briefly um, with some of the, the early history. In 1915, your father arrives in this country. He's a refugee from a small town near Minsk. He's penniless, he's unable to speak the language, and within his lifetime, a single generation, he lives to see one of his sons, Stuart of blessed memory, become the chairman of the BBC, and the other, you, a cabinet minister. So um, I wonder whether it is something uh, about immigrants or something about your family. Oh, I think it's about immigrants. And there's a long, research that's been done to show that immigrants really in many ways try harder because they're coming to a new place. My father was five years old when he came here, was brought here by his father, his parents, um, and um, they, they lived in the East End as everybody did. They started off with the same as everybody else and they prospered. They prospered, he was never a big businessman, he ran a small business. But he and my mother were wonderful parents and Stuart and I had the best possible upbringing. He, he gave us, um, I suppose, ambition, but the right sort of ambition. Because dad said to Stuart and I, uh, on one occasion, I was about 16, Stuart must have been 14 then at that time, he sat us down and he said, boys, he said, whatever you do in this life, you've got to give back. Give back to our community, <clears throat> but also to the wider community, because if this country hadn't let me in, you wouldn't be here today. And, wow. and that was something I've never forgotten. That is a very strong um, sort of sentiment which comes from uh, from an immigrant who has been given yes. here in this country. Uh, I want to just very quickly run through some of the significant events of your early life. Uh, you train as a solicitor, but the law doesn't grab you. At your yes. wedding, you're offered a job at uh, Gus, Great Uni Universal Stores. You spend five formative years as Isaac Wolfson's personal assistant. 
but the entrepreneurial urge pulls you and you leave to go into business by yourself. Britain at that time is building a network of motorways and you have this genius idea of locating distribution depots at key junctions. So you build a successful business within no time, within a few years, you've sold out to town and city properties, you go on the board, you get caught by the property crash of the 90, early 1970s, you have to start all over again, you enter into a joint venture with manufacturers, Hanover Bank lending to real estate. But around this time, you meet a man, Max Brody, who changes your life and changes your thinking. Yes. Tell us about him. Well, <clears throat> you know, uh, all of my generation, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have television. So what did we do when we were young? We went on charity committees. So it became part of where we'd meet. And as the years went on, I became chairman. Uh, I, I started to work for Alt, World Alt Union, which is uh, probably today the largest vocational and technical training system around the world. And the, um, the Director General of Ort, which was in Geneva at that time, was an American rabbi by the name of Max Browdy, who was a chaplain to the forces in the war, came over to Europe um, and was at the first people in to not one, but two different death camps. And what he said there changed his life. He stayed behind in Europe and he didn't go back to the States. And <clears throat> he was a very charismatic figure. Um, and one day I'm sitting, I had a very smart office over manufacturers, had of a bank in Brook Street, looking over Grosvenor Square. And one day he rings me up and he said, David, he said, you're not that important, you can't take a week off and come with me to Israel. And such was the force of his character that I could only say, yes, of course, when? And a few weeks later, we go. We stayed at the Hilton in Tel Aviv. You could, I would never have known it because he got me out, just gone six every morning. We didn't get back till 9.30, 10 at night. And we visited every art school in the network in Israel. Arab schools, Druze, and of course, all, all, all our schools. And that week showed me that what education can really do <clears throat> to motivate young people. In fact, if you start using your hands, so we, we have a 19th century education system. It's back to the days of writing exams. We had incidentally all this fuss a few months ago about exams here. Exams are so yesterday, we should have continuous testing, but, but that's another matter. Anyway, I really got inspired by what he did. So when I came back, I started to work for Keith Joseph and every shadow minister I came across, I would slap them to Paris to look at the art schools in Paris. Just to put it into context for the moment, David, for our listeners, um, sure. uh, at this point in time, the Conservative government, we're talking about the early 1970s, the Conservative government are in opposition, um, and Keith Joseph, Sir Keith Joseph, as he became, is one of the leading lights, one of the thinkers, and there is some new thinking afoot that, uh, yes. that attracts you and excites you. Okay. Yes. Right. Well, for the first time, they talked about enterprise. Now, I must tell you that the conservative, post-war conservative governments were paternalistic. Uh, they believed that the most they could do is slow down socialism. They never really had any clear ideas about what you could do uh, with an economy. But Keith Joseph started making speeches about the need for enterprise. And then, they, one, then once one day I met Margaret Thatcher well, let me say, before we come back to that, David, before we come to that, and before we come to, to, to Margaret, so I think you, you and um, Keith Joseph was invited to an auto dinner, which is where you met him, and you, you kind of like kicked, he was talking your, speaking your yeah. language, you were speaking his language. Sure. So you become, you get drawn little by little into the Conservative Party and their new thinking. They're still in opposition at this point in time, 
but there's some really exciting stuff which is going on. Before we come to these new ideas about enterprise that were floating around uh, in the minds of people like Keith Joseph, just remind some of us, um, most of us are old enough to remember it, but there may be some who can't quite remember what it was like in England in the 1970s. Paint the background that we're talking about. Well, we, it was a decade of strikes, a, a decade, the unions, well, let me, let me put it this way, there are three main ingredients. In the war, it was quite right, the taxes should be very, very high. But when the war ended, they kept them high. Now, you might say, how high are taxes? Well, over £20,000 a year, which is probably 60 today or 70, taxes were 83 percent and there was a 15 percent surcharge so interest and dividends you paid 98 percent tax and one year of blessed memory 1977 the chancellor put a surcharge of five percent and my accountant told me i had to pay myself a dividend and i paid tax at the rate of 103 percent <laughs> the result was there was no point in having a business. Everybody cheated. Everybody lived out of it. And the economy went down and down. So and if you were... a three-day week as well, wasn't there? There was Sorry? the three-day three week. Oh, there were strikes at the beginning of the decade with a three-day week. Why a three-day week? <clears throat> there were so many strikes and power generation. There wasn't the energy around to let offices or shops open for more than three days a week. And you are allocating Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or some people at the middle of the week. And the awful thing was, a year later, when the figures came out, our productivity actually went up. Our economy was so bad, so run down, that we could do more in a three-day week than we normally did in a five. But that, that's it's another against, story. So it's against this background that you start talking to Keith Joseph. Yeah. And he starts to introduce you to some uh, other people in the Conservative Party, still in opposition, who are thinking along the same lines. You're a businessman, you're full of fizz, you know, all kinds of ideas about enterprise. And for the first time, you've encountered a politician who is beginning to think just like you. So you get really engaged. Yeah. Who do you meet after Keith? Who does he meet? <clears throat> well, no, I, I, there was, a, 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 it still goes today, the Centre for Policy Studies, which, which he ran, which was working on policies for the new government when, when it came in. And I went on the board of that. And I would see, I, I should make one thing quite clear. <clears throat> I'm a somewhat, I had a somewhat unusual entry into this. I was not a member of the party. I have never in my life ever asked anybody to vote. I've never canvassed. I came in as a technocrat. I became his special advisor. And um, one thing led to another until one day I found myself sitting in cabinet <clears throat> and I realized I hadn't yet joined the party. <laughs> so I joined that afternoon in, in a very sneaky way, which now I could tell you, I couldn't tell you before, there was a constituency in, my, in, um, in here, in, in Westminster, and there was a constituency in Chichester. And I wrote to both, both chairmen, said, it's about time I joined you as well. So they assumed that I belonged to the other one. Anyway, I, but that, that's another part of the story. Okay, so between the, the years of 1979 <clears throat> and 1989, it's a very significant decade in your life. You, as a result of that first introduction and being drawn into the party, you hold a series of government positions that include inter alia, chairman of the Manpower Services Commission, a member of the National Development Council. You're appointed to the Lords, you become a cabinet minister without portfolio, you become secretary of state for employment, secretary of state for trade and industry, and president of the board of trade, to name just a few. How does this all unfold? Take us through it step by step. Well, it started off with ought. <clears throat> because I had taken shadow ministers to Paris, 
they thought I knew something about training and something about education. Uh, my original job was to start privatization. I'd been a finance man and, and that's what I started doing. But I hadn't been there many months before they came to see me to tell me that for the past 20 years, every year, there'd been more closures than startups in small businesses. And the number had come all the way down to 650,000. Um, put it in context, there were 7 million before COVID started. So it had gone right down to the ground. So I, with enthusiasm, started proposing programs to help new startups, to help new, uh, new companies get going. But it's and important, to, David, to just to, to remember that the whole concept of running your own business at this point in time is not a very English thing. It's not, uh, it's not uh, seen with any great sense of enthusiasm. Well, it's even worse than that. When I first went on my own and people would ask me what I did, I was not in a hurry to say I worked for myself because the ethos at that time was profit was theft. That if you made money, somebody lost money. So the whole thing, they, they, they thought it was a closed system uh, and it took a long time. Um, the biggest problem we had, I'm going ahead a bit, the ages, were to persuade people that they could work for themselves and then that they should work for themselves. And um, I, I used to go out and because I'd been an entrepreneur, um, I mean, a number of the politicians looked upon me with some uh, suspicion as somebody who'd worked for themselves. But we had such a revolution. But come on what to that later. That, what were the things that you, did, that you did? Because particularly during the time you worked with Margaret Thatcher, which we'll come to in a moment, uh, it seems that you achieved an enormous amount. Well, um, I was, it, it, it was there for the doing. Um, when, when I was working at the Department for Industry, Norman Tevitt came along as Minister of State by the I way, got, the rumours are that you didn't have a very comfortable relationship with Norman Tebbit. We had a difficult day, put it that way, but we're fine. I mean, it's not. Um, I mean, elections, well, I don't recommend elections to anybody being part of an election. Anyway, then uh, Norman became Secretary of State for Employment. <clears throat> Youth unemployment started to go up enormously. I mean, you cannot imagine it today, but in those days, on the 1st of September, 400,000 16-year-olds left school and went on the unemployment register. And these young people were probably getting 50p pocket money from their parents, suddenly were getting 15 pounds a week from the state. And it just struck completely the wrong lesson. So, Norman realized I had this background. The chairman of the Manpower Services resigned. Now, I was somebody <clears throat> who only speeches I'd made in my life were charity appeals. I, I'd never got out to make any, any speeches. And I suddenly became overnight the chairman of the Manpower Services Commission, which at that time was by far the biggest government agency. It had offices all over the country. Unemployment was the big political problem of the day. It went up on a workforce a third smaller than today, because there were, in that case, only 22, three quarter million people in employment as against 32 today. Uh, unemployment went up to three and a half million. It was like it was five million. And the businesses were bust and everything was closing down. And, we'd run out of money and everything was, was really, really very difficult. And the only way you could begin to get the economy back, I believed, was by starting from the ground up to start to create new small businesses, planting acorns. And those acorns have led to the oak forest we have in the economy today. So you started the Enterprise Allowance Scheme? We, well, yes. We, um, we started a whole lot. We had the youth trading scheme because I was determined 
and happily the government agreed with me, that we would not let young people go and languish at home getting paid by the state because that's the worst way to start. And in those 400,000 that came on in, in uh, 1st of September, by Christmas in the first year, all but 7,000 had been fixed with an employer. And uh, instead of getting 16 pounds or 15 pounds a week, they got 25, but they worked. And we had training programs and it was something which served at a time when there was no real economy to give them jobs. Then there was a program <clears throat> to give people who are unemployed some work to do called the community program, which we dreamt up and we put it. Uh, and then uh, finally, we had the enterprise allowance scheme. Now, all this said was, if you've been out of work for three months, you had an idea of a, you'd like to set up your own business. You could beg, borrow, preferably not steal a thousand pounds. We would pay you your unemployment benefit for a year without any commitment on your part to do anything other than set up this business. Over the next five, six years, 350,000 businesses started as a result of that. See, the British people is funda fundamentally entrepreneurial. What they didn't have was the opportunity and they didn't have people telling them they could do it. They were telling them the opposite, that they couldn't. And you know that really took off two of those companies, made the FTSE 100, and Fantastic. became two of the last 100, 30 years later. That's a great story. But um, <clears throat> the relationship with, uh, with Margaret Thatcher, uh, many of her ministers really couldn't get on with her at all. Uh, you know, we heard from Michael Heseltine a while back to say that they were um, yes, you would with Michael, uh, absolutely. Were not fun, they just, uh, you know, she was bombastic, she didn't give you a chance to speak, etc. In her memoirs, and this touches on the fact that you're a businessman, that you're not elected, that you're coming from the outside, and Margaret Thatcher writes in the memoirs, as a general rule, I did not bring outsiders directly into cabinet, feeling that previous experience of this had not been altogether happy. David Young was an exception and proved eminently worthy of being so. Well, that's a nice accolade, isn't it? it what is was nice it about accolade. your relationship with Margaret Thatcher uh, that allowed the two of you to get on so well together when so many others simply could not get on with this perceived to well, be difficult woman? It, it's not due to any attributes of mine. Let, let me explain. Keith Joseph was a remarkable person. There I was sitting in my lavish offices in Grosvenor Square, and I'd go in and become a volunteer in government. I wouldn't draw a salary for the whole 10 years. They give me um, an under, a, a small office with a desk, three chairs, a tape recorder, and a hat stand, and Keith left me alone. I did not see him. I had to work my way through the civil service. And after a year, when I'd found out how it worked, <clears throat> I'd got through, he then picked me up and took me on the top floor and I started doing things. I'd spent five years working every day in the government before I went into cabinet. I knew more about the workings of cabinet, of working of the government than most of my colleagues did. So if I'd have been an outsider, I would have been lost. You see, in government, in the outside world, if you're running something, you tell people nicely what you'd like them to do. In the civil service, you persuade them nicely what you want them to do. There's a way you can do it. But were, were you aware, David, that other ministers were jealous of you? You know, Edwina Curries says in her diaries, he is certainly thoroughly disliked by many MPs. He acts as if he is chairman of a big private company and such subtle political considerations are not for him. You must have been a real bruiser. You were stepping all over people's feet over here. No, yeah. no, I wasn't. No, no. Look, um, <clears throat> politics is, is a very funny business and the people in it have left 
if I may say so, in many cases, quite sheltered life. I came in from the outside, <clears throat> but what they didn't appreciate is what I'd been doing and what, what I got going, you see. And so there was jealousy. You, you know this infamous remark that Margaret's alleged to have made about other, other ministers bring me problems, David brings me solutions or something. Well, I, I must tell you, my heart sank when I saw that. And the next time I walked into the cabinet, and I could, absolutely, the temperature dropped at least five degrees as I came in. I was not the most popular chap, but there you are. They got used to me. Yeah. But working with Margaret Thatcher, tell us about her personality, about her clarity of thought. And Margaret grew up <clears throat> over the shop in Grantham, where her father kept a shop. And I have no doubt the dinner table, Turk at night, was what was selling, what wasn't selling. And she, she knew all the basic virtues about self-respect, working for yourself, working for your family, and making sure that you paid your way. When she came into government, she wanted the government to run like that shop in Grantham. That she wanted to make sure that we could only afford to do what we do. But the other thing where she was wonderful, if she knew something was wrong, nothing could make her do it, morally wrong. And so, you know, um, she, you just have to look, for example, at uh, Falklands. Single-handedly, that woman did something restored our sense of pride after 30 years. I, I could still remember Sears. <clears throat> and when the Americans told us, take your toys and go home, you know, you're playing above your league. And 30 years later, we still hadn't recovered from that. And when Galtieri invaded, first of all, South Georgia, and then the Falkland Islands, she was not, and all her colleagues, almost, were trying to tell her to settle. We can compromise. We'll grant them a lease. They wanted to do things like that. She said, no. She said, these people are British who live on the island. Nobody asked them to come here. And she just determined. And when she did that, this whole country changed. All of a sudden, we had a sense of pride and achievement. He literally put the great back into Britain. And, and for that, that transformed her chances. She became the Iron Lady and it transformed this country. It sounds to me when you describe her as the daughter of a shopkeeper and Valen's talking, sitting around the table at night, talking about what sells and what doesn't sell, that we've just now understood the real reason why you and her hit it off so well. You were of like mind. You were coming yes. from exactly the same kind of background. Your yep. thinking was identical. Yes, yeah. <clears throat> That's why we, we got on, you know, and it was, but I admired her. I mean, I don't know anybody who worked as hard as she worked. Um, she literally, I mean, when I go to see her, I always have the uncomfortable feeling she knew rather more about my department than I did. <laughs> and, and most people have that. She never stopped. She got two hours sleep a night, something like that. So but, I want to move uh, on a little bit because in 1988, when you were president of the Board of Trade at the Department of Trade and Industry, you, you held what was dubbed as ministerial prayers meetings. You had a group of people coming together once a week without the presence of civil servants, which was a little bit unusual. And there was a young man who had been hired to do some research for the Conservative Party who sat at the bottom of the table. 22 years later, following the 2010 election, that young man became the prime minister and he invited yes. you in your 70s to join his government and to become his advisor on enterprise with an office once again in Downing Street. So tell yes. us about your relationship with David Cameron. Oh, I mean, that I, I never thought that I met David because I mean, first of all, I would hold these weekly lunches because I knew from my business life, which that unless you meet and talk to each other, you don't communicate. And so many departments 
had junior ministers not on speaking terms to their boss, things like that. So sitting around the table <clears throat> with people like Alan Clark and Kenneth Clark were very amusing and enjoyable, but we communicated. There was this chap so far below the salt, I need binoculars to see him. Um, and then one day I get a phone call that David Cameron, would, could I come and see him? And I thought, that's funny, I don't really, really know that, you know, who he is. So I walk in and I realized it was him. And um, I think because he'd seen me over those years, uh, I was 78, which is a good time to start a new life. And I went in and I spent five actually fulfilling years, five very good years for me in number 10. And I got a great deal done quietly without any publicity. Was it different working with David Cameron to working with Oh, Margaret? yes. Oh, yes. The antithesis of Margaret, he was. Um, David is a very nice person, companionable. I'd love to have dinner with him. It was always slightly awkward having dinner with Margaret, but, but never. But he didn't believe in anything in particular. With Margaret, I knew if I sent something down to her, I knew whether she'd say yes straight away or I'd have trouble. With David, it could be one thing one day. In the afternoon, it could be something else. If you don't have a belief system in you, then you look at everything, does it appear attractive or not attractive? You really, to be in politics and that thing, you really got to know where you're going and how you're, you know, you, you must believe this is right and that's wrong. I'm so, tempted, I'm so tempted to stray into current current affairs, but I think we'll just steer clear of that for the moment. I want to <laughs> instead, in the time we have left, I want David to turn uh, seriously to, to two of the, the really dominant themes of your life, the things that have been most important for you. Um, and the first is charity. And the second is this absolute total conviction in the need to give people opportunities to flourish in employment, young people, uh, to give them a chance in, in life, to create the systems, the structures, the programs that will allow them to flourish. And, and I want to, to talk about some of these, uh, these two, these two um, issues, sure. both not so much in terms of the, the historical context, but more really in a contemporary terms, in, term, in terms of where we are today. So I just want to, I want to start with, with charity because, um, you know, you described working for those five years so closely with Isaac Wolfson as watching philanthropy in, in action. Uh, you described the way in which your father sat you and Stuart down and said, you have to give something back to the, to the community and to the country. So over the course of your life, uh, you have been hugely involved in, in all kinds of charity. You've been, uh, to mention some of them, Ort, of course, as the Director General of World Ort, uh, first president of Jewish Care, bringing together all the disparate parts and rationalizing it, etc. President to this day of High Cancer Care, president of the Institute of Directors, chairman of the London Philippon Philipp Philharmonic Order Trust, chairman of the Jewish Museum, it just goes on and on and on and on. What is this burning desire to engage with charity? Why is it so important? Well, it, it's two things. Um, I define charity at Sadoka, and it's not money, it's effort. Money comes into it, of course, but you've got to put personal effort into something to help to, to create it. And it, it's a very interesting thing. The, um, all my life, from the very beginning, I spent time in outside activities. I never spent less than a third of my time doing non-profit making things. And I used to think occasionally, why things go well, the more time you spend outside, things go well in the inside. And then I realized one day that actually well, what it was, and if you live in your business and you live in a fairly narrow, confined world, you don't need people. If you don't spend a lot of time doing outside activities. But when you go outside <clears throat> and meet lots of people, all sorts of opportunities come up. 
And if you take those opportunities, you gives you a more interesting life. You see, Shlomo, I worked out a long time ago that we only go this way once. Who, who knows? I just, and how can I best use that time? Not for myself, but to make an interesting life and to help as many people as I can. I was helped when I was young, working for GUS, um, not so much Isaac, whom I worship, but one or two people there really encouraged me to go on my own. You know, I'm a highly unemployable figure. Um, I spent five years, I, I spent five years as a lawyer, hated the law. I spent five years working for GUS, realized I hated working for everybody. So what does somebody who can't work for anybody do? He works for himself. So I went off and started. But all the way through, um, you know, if I look back now, you, you see, I, I think I'd possibly told you this. I regard myself as wise these days. This is not flattering myself. My definition of wisdom is the memory of past mistakes. And the simple truth is that unless you do things, unless you make straight mistakes, you don't grow in yourself. I am a very different person from the person when I first went into the outside world. You know, when we're born, we are a body and an empty mind. And we fill that mind by experience, by what we do. When we're very young, we learn to get on with siblings. We learn to get on with young people in primary school and then in secondary school. And then you go through life and you learn to get on. And, you, and if you learn, then you makes your life easier and better. And, you know, it, it's just one of those things. So even today, I want to start doing new things. You know, it, I, I wonder it's crazy. If, uh, hearing you, um, you know, and they're very inspiring and, and beautiful words, but uh, you and, and your generation, the, and many of the people who are actually with us on, on this Zoom tonight, as I looked around just before we started, you are the people who really built Anglo Jewry. You built the institutions. You were the first generation or second generation, you know, in terms of, of, of immigrants. Uh, you were educated, uh, but you were still very close to the source and still a very strong sense of needing to give back to the community that had been so yeah. good for you. So you built welfare. And you, and, you, and, you built, and you built education, you built the schools, and, and you supported the synagogues and the communities. Um, this is something which is a period of time post-war for people like you, and in some instances, the well, parents- About nine, but yeah. yeah. I, wonder, I wonder therefore whether this is now repeatable, whether the next generation, your children, I don't mean your children literally, your two daughters, no. I mean, the children of this generation, I wonder whether we have now succumbed to a much more comfortable life, uh, a, a, a more affluent life, and whether that fire, that energy, that need to, to give back, to do good things, to change the world, to, you know, call it tikkun olam, whatever term you want to use for it. But I wonder, is it still there? Do you see it in young people today? Look, well, I am. <clears throat> We had a very different upbringing. Uh, Stuart and I, I was seven, Stuart was five. We were evacuated, not with our parents. We went off with the school uh, when the war, just before the war broke out for three months. We come back, we live in the middle of the Blitz and we live in, in difficult circumstances throughout the war. And of course, after the war, this country is poor. It's cold, it's, it's a bit miserable. But we had the community. When I grew up, <clears throat> there was no internet. There was no television. There was a bit of radio. There were youth clubs, which normally were in the synagogue. And uh, I became chairman of a charities aid committee when I was 20. Um, because a young person's committee, because that's what we all did. And we thought that way. Young people today have so many opportunities so many dispersed their interests, so many opportunities to really different in education, 
that it's very difficult to recreate that. And do I mean that the community will be the loser? I do, in fact. I do not see the 30 and 40-year-olds, even some of the 50-year-olds, coming forward in the way in which my generation did. You know, we- It's really interesting, it'd be, it'd be fascinating to hear some views from some of the people who have joined us this evening as to whether they agree with that. But I don't want to upset anybody, <laughs> but uh, I'd love to be proven wrong. Yeah. I wonder, by the way, whether you feel that Jewish charities are going to, uh, will be, take a hit from the recession uh, that due to coronavirus and uh, what this is going to do, what impact it's going to have upon our whole charitable structure. Well, it will have an impact, but I, I have a feeling that we might come out of this far quicker. Uh, the Bank of England thinks we're going to snap back. It will be difficult, but, um, you know, as a community, we have lots of problems and uh, so far, we've always found a way of getting through them. Mm. Um, I just want to touch before we move on to, to employment on um, the, the fact that so many people have employees have been furloughed and been paid yes. to stay at home for almost 12 months without any quid pro quo. Could we not have ignited another sense of community giving at this time that those who were receiving public funding should be asked to give back in some way? Could we not have created a series of voluntary programs uh, and inspire, well, in, in, inspire and excite the, uh, the idealism of a younger generation? Well, I, <clears throat> this is above my pay grade, so I would not there. But I would be, I think the Chancellor probably thought that this would be a short recession. We'd have one lockdown and we'd back. So you can pay furlough for two months, three months. I don't think he ever dreamt it would go on for as long as it would go. And I know people have been furloughed. First of all, it's terribly bad for an individual to be paid to stay at home to do nothing. Secondly, the cost, we're going to have to pay all this back at some time or other. Um, yes, I think, well, um, who, who knows, even if we're over it now, this is the trouble. This is a once in a hundred year occurrence. <clears throat> when it happened 101 years ago, um, so many more people, the world population was only one and a half billion. Today it's 7.8 billion. You know, 500 million of that one and a half billion got Spanish flu, 50 million died. There was no cure, there was no treatment, there was nothing. It was devastation, and it came after a war. And yet, the 20s snapped back. We did not have years of devastation afterwards. I think a lot of people, and I might include myself in this to some extent, has spent a year, you, you know, the government abolished indeterminate sentences. You can't send somebody to jail without giving them a time. Well, we've been sent to jail. I've been living in Grafham since last March, you know, and I'm trying to get like good behavior. And we can see the background. It looks like a terrible jail. Are you fed three <laughs> meals a day? Yes, I'm very happy here. But, but I miss people, of course. D David, turning to employment, most commentators yeah. uh, predict that the COVID pandemic is going to produce huge unemployment uh, and it's dramatically affected both employers and employees. Now, 40 years ago, as you've been describing to us, you were at the cutting edge of providing workable yeah. solutions for unemployment. I wonder whether you see similarities or differences between then and now, and can yeah. the strategies that you employed then work now? Well, <clears throat> first of all, it's going to be a vastly different unemployment. It's difficult unless you live through it to realize how everything, all right, let, let me go back one step. I, I, a few years ago, I kept on reading how we should nationalize the railways, we should nationalize this, we should that. I, my job is to get rid of the nationalized industries. Once you nationalize anything, when the industry wants money, it goes to the chancellor. The chancellor in his budget has to make up his mind between giving money 
to the gas board or money for pensions. Now, he's only human. Every year they gave it for pensions. All our industries were run down and broke, old fashioned. And when they collapsed, there was no easy way to get back. Also, <clears throat> people hadn't thought or didn't know they could go and work for themselves. This time, the unemployment's going to be entirely different in character. You're running a local restaurant. You go down because you don't have any customers, but you're able. And what I'm telling the government, or what I would like us to see us do, is set up a series of schemes, not, not like furlough money, which is money that's eaten, but money that's led to restart people. Once you've got the ability, anybody who's got a business that's been making money, had to close, we should help him get started. It's a loan. The money will come back. And I think we could really do this. We, we nearly need to set up a task force and do this in, in a massive scale, and it could be done. Got to be careful because it could you be fortunate. Article, you wrote an article for the, for the Daily Telegraph in which you said that, as a matter of fact, it was published earlier today, and thank you for yeah. alerting me to it. Uh, but in that article, you <clears throat> said that actually the mechanism for, to do it in terms of the governmental structure in the government departments, notwithstanding an appropriate Secretary of State, but beneath that, uh, you are suggesting that the mechanics are not there in the way that they were uh, when you had the opportunity to do these things. Can you just elaborate on that, please? Well, um, political is a, politics is a very short-sighted um, business. Uh, we had a wonderful infrastructure which dealt with very difficult unemployment. So as soon as the unemployment goes, they wind it all down, but they don't even leave the embryo there. We no longer have a DTI. We no longer have parts of government that can actually set out programs. The easy bit is designing the program. It worked in the 80s, it worked in 2010, it will work tomorrow, I know exactly. But the point is, how do you go out and make sure that these people aren't ripping off government because you're, you're lending money, and unfortunately a lot of people who take advantage of things. So I've, I've proposed that we set up a task force. We bring in a number of entrepreneurs to, to motivate and direct the civil service on how they will administer the program. Are you, are you suggesting something that is parallel to the vaccine task force that has been so successful? Yes, I, I am, because that, that has been brilliantly successful. Um, we're seeing a rate of vaccination nobody would have dreamt possible. And we can do it. Um, and I'm quite sure we can do it. Um, I think I'll be, I think I might be a little bit old for it myself, but I'm quite happy to help. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, um, I wanted to, I, I wanted to make you an offer you can't refuse. Yeah. You can have any job you want, your choice. It won't detract from the time you spend with your wife and family. But at 89 years old, you've got lots and lots and lots of um, steam st still to, to, to burn uh, and um, a lot of good ideas. What job would you like? Education secretary. I would like to reform. First of all, we have a terribly overexpanded tertiary university sector where people are getting Mickey Mouse degrees and, and leaving with a big debt. Sorry to interrupt you, David, but are we coming back to your ought experience when you go out to Israel and you see people who are uh, doing different kinds of things because they're learning, they're learning different kinds of skills that are not academic and they're applying them to the workplace? No, no, now I'm talking purely about academic. I know my experience at university. I mean, I took a law degree in the evenings, but wherever. I would not work in the term. And then six weeks before the exam, I'd spend all day and night working. I'd get through. I mean, when, when I left school, uh, I left school at 16 uh, to go and work as an article clerk in, in the city. And I suddenly found I needed to have a trick in Latin. I'd never done Latin. So I went to a crammer's 
and I managed to scrape through. And a week I'd forgotten every bit of Latin I'd ever learned. So what was the point of, of actually taking it? I think we can have a system these days without exams. You have continuous assessment all the way through. And that makes sure that people won't be like me and play around for most of the year and only work at the end. They will have to do things all the way around. It could simplify, but you know, I, it, it, it's, it's a, that or the universities is, is, is the last job I would, next job I wouldn't mind doing, but I'm not sure I'm, I'm up for it. Okay, well, we're going to um, spend a few moments um, inviting people to, um, to ask any questions that they might like to. Um, you need to just um, unmute yourselves and you can do that either by clicking or by pressing your space bars, yep. which by the way will uh, unmute you for the period of time that you're speaking. Um, there are a, um, Maurice Ostre has made a very nice comment over here. Uh, Maurice, would you like to make this comment, please, um, online? I, I'd be delighted to, and partly I would, uh, yes, may, can you hear me now? Yes. I'd be delighted to, and I must say oh, that uh, I, I have certainly looked forward to working uh, with, with David now, despite his modesty about uh, willing to get, when I started to, discussing with him the, the Business Action Council, which is all the representative um, organizations in the country coming together to try to move the economy forward after COVID. And I said, you know, would you like to just give me some suggestions, strategies, how I should steer this group? And he was like, forget that. I'll roll my sleeves up and I'm coming in there and deal with you. And immediately I was talking to the uh, our new business uh, secretary of state and uh, uh, mentioned to him and he says you know that's really funny so he was sharing this with the head of this uh, the civil service um, and he, I get a whatsapp a few minutes later he says the head of the civil service has just told me because he doesn't know David Young and I was telling him about David he said that the last time we had a secretary of state for business that paid any attention to entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship as opposed to big business and FTSE companies was in the 1980s under David Young this is the current head of the civil service today. So for all his modesty, he is in there He's texting me this morning and passing on his messages to various people in government. But David, he is fully in there. And it's been Thank a you. delight. Anybody to hear. Any women like to make any comments, please, from amongst our large audience tonight? Thank you, boys. <laughs> Don't be shy. Anybody can ask. You know, when I was in politics, I used to dream of having an audience like this. <laughs> Nobody hey, wants any questions. Can <laughs> I ask a question, Shlomo? It's Gerald Reingold. Please, Gerald. Hello, Gerald. Yeah, Hi, David, Gerald. how are you? And Hi, good to very see good you. to hear you again. Um, you gave a very interesting chat recently at the Abraham Society on your views on Brexit. I don't expect you to spend 40 minutes now on that, but I think for the others here, just a few words might go down well. Well, um, actually, after I finished that, we've had the vaccines and nothing could better illustrate the difficulties of the EU, um, the way they organize themselves, to short circuit a 50 minute speech talk. Um, we have never been part of Europe, well, not since 8,000 years. And we've developed differently from the way the continental Europe has developed. Our fundamental legal system here is um, common law, which developed through the battles between the king and the barons and the king and parliament. And that says very clearly that um, anybody can do whatever they like so the law says you can't. Across the channel, Roman law prevailed and Rome ran a big dictatorship. And under and the civil code, which is descended from Roman law, says you cannot do anything until the law says you can. Which is <clears throat> the reason why um, the industrial revolution started here and didn't start across the channel because across the channel, somebody would have to get permission 
to open up a factory and people wouldn't even know what a factory was. And that see the whole time, the way the city of London can always adapt and change things. So when, when, when the, the Euro came into being, it was London was the headquarters. It wasn't Frankfurt or Paris. And you will see as the years go by, COVID was, the vaccine was not a fluke, that we will have great opportunities now to take out of our system a lot of the bureaucratic stuff we've inherited in Europe. It does not mean to say we cannot be friendly with people in Europe. It doesn't mean to say we can't go there just as before. It does mean that we will become the entrepreneurial heart of Europe. Thank you, David. Anyone else? You've often said that the more time you spent on charity, the better your business uh, performed. Yeah. How would you suggest to the younger generation that they could uh, learn from this? Well, I don't want them to learn from me. I want them to learn for themselves. Uh, the fact is that if you spend, and, and by charity, I'm not talking about fundraising. Uh, because that's one aspect of charity. And uh, yes, you, you can organize that. But there's also working in the charities. There's also helping things to get organized. It's, it's also part of our education system. And the more time you spend outside, the more you learn. I think I, I said a bit earlier that, um, you know, you come into this world, you're an empty vessel. And as you grow, you only grow through experience. Well, the more you have experience in activities outside your business, the more you bring the lessons you learn from those activities back into what you do. It broadens the mind. It gives you, well, experience. I wouldn't call it wisdom, experience. Thank you. And one last question for anyone. Uh, we have the ball rolling. David, it looks like you've flummoxed them. Uh, hello. Oh no, we I've got a, a I've got a question. Okay. Hi, Hi. Uh, Lord Young. Um, just if you had, if you could Brian, introduce one, Brian, just adjust your camera yeah. so we can see more more easily. All oh, right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Lord Young, interesting and fascinating talk. Um, if you could introduce one reform into this country to make it more even more successful uh, from your experience, what would that reform be? Some institutions, some rule change, what would it be? Maybe there's more than one. Well, you, you, there isn't a magic bullet, but I, I come back to what I said before. We have an antiquated education system and we're moving into a very technological world. Uh, and that I could uh, look in the eighties. I mean, this is what upsets me. I spent 10 years in the eighties. We introduced technical and vocational programs into the school system. We introduced training programs into the colleges. We did a whole host of things. And it was quite a busy 10 years. I come back 21 years later. You should never come back, I think is, is the moral of this story. Come back to find every single thing, every single thing I did in the ages had gone. For example, I just introduced something that teacher training must spend two weeks in a firm. So he has some experience of what the world was. that's got. Every single thing had gone. Um, uh, and uh, we were back where we were then with a 19th century education system. So that, that is what I do. It's the hardest thing, thing to do. But, but, you know. Okay, everyone, thank you all for your participation. And we're going to um, end the session tonight. And uh, David, I want to say to you, you've just said one should never come back. Uh, I'd like to say to you, actually, that one should never go away. Uh, and, certainly, <laughs> and certainly in regard to um, not just what you have done, but the spirit in which you've done it, and the sense of excitement and of energy 
uh, the indefatigable sense of always another challenge, another idea, more energy. That is the really inspirational thing uh, about, about your very, very remarkable life. Uh, and um, we wish you uh, and your wife uh, continued good health and may you continue to flourish uh, and to be active for many, many years to come. Yeah. And I hope that this country will continue both in its business context and in its charitable context as well to benefit from your wisdom and from, from your energy and from your creativity. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I'm sure that everybody who's been together with us has really, really enjoyed uh, listening to you, hearing from you, uh, and uh, please God on other good occasions in the future as well. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. Uh, and there's only one thing I haven't said, and that is, and it's not because she's sitting in the room with me, mm. but if I hadn't had my wife with me over those years, mm. it would have been a lot harder and it would not have yeah. been as good. Yeah. You've, had a one, you've had a wonderful marriage, and I believe yes. you have had how many six, over 60 years together? Uh, no, it will be 65. 65, mm. 65, 65 in March. And, 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 and many more to come as well. Come. well. Thank you, everybody, and thank you once thank again you. to Maurice for, um, for yes. renewing yes. my relationship with David, setting it up, uh, to Neil and Moss, who helped as well with some of the uh, ideas and the questions, etc. Uh, and um, thank you all so much for joining us uh, until the next happy occasion. Uh, we'll be in, um, interviewing Mr. Pierce in a couple of weeks' time. You'd like to join us for that. He is our constituency um, uh, as well, um, and we look forward to seeing you. <laughs>